Welcome to the One Hero Podcast, where we answer Malaysians' burning questions about personal finance with fact-based answers. Since 2013, Mercury Securities has helped Malaysian companies IPO. About two weeks ago, on the 19th of September, it was their own turn to IPO on the ACE market. Its debut saw its shares sell at 27 cents a share, which saw Mercury Securities raise 39.27 million from the IPO on a market capitalization of 223.25 million. On today's episode of Stock Investing from Zero on One Hero, we're asking, should you invest in Mercury Securities? So John, what 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 is what what is Mercury Securities doing? Before you mentioned it, I actually had no idea about but this. Yeah. Uh, most people, when they think about stockbroking, they think about the big guys are like CIMB, mm -hmm. Maybank, Public Bank, and these are all bank back, right? And Mercury Securities, why I actually uh, I picked it, a, a few reasons. One is uh, I personally know the owner. That's one. Oh, <laughs> that okay. is one. Uh, when I was helping list a company that I was with uh, prior to this, they were our listing underwriter, actually, a placement agent. So the second reason why I picked it was because by far it is one of they've not listed the stockbrokers uh, for a very, very long time in Malaysia. Stockbroking mm. business is very hard to list. Okay. And this is, I think, for the at least 10 years, uh, no stockbroker has actually listed. So this is one of the one that has happened after a, a long, you know, uh, absent, uh, right? So some interesting facts about Mercury, uh, formerly known as Sabrang Security Center. So they actually came from Sabrang Prai Penang. Okay. Incorporated 1984, involved in the stockbroking business. Uh, the current main owner, Mr. Chu Sing Guan, he actually started with only 35%. He acquired 35%, oh, slowly, slowly acquired more, acquired more along the way. Obviously, during during the prospectus, you can you can read all of it there. But mm -hmm. he uh, became the, the owner operator and really grew the business, uh, okay? Uh, the biggest listing that they've actually done is actually Sen, Sen Heng. You know, oh, your shop that, that you know, yeah, sell yeah. electrical appliances or that kind of thing. Yeah, they listed Sen Heng in January 2022 last year uh, for a market cap of about 1.28 billion. Uh. So that's like some interesting facts that you have about Mercury. <laughs> mm. I mean, I mean, okay. So you mentioning it's it's kind of complicated to list like stock brokers, right? What what makes it complicated? So is it because the business model is unique, or why is it complicated? Uh, there's a lot more regulation and due diligence that needs to take place because mm -hmm. uh, it is actually involved with the exchange also, ma. So <laughs> it's involved in exchange. A kind of meta, right? So like IP. Yeah. IP. <laughs> <laughs> so, many, so many layers okay so yeah, yeah so uh, the, does that like cover all the things in question one like what does the company need to okay do yeah so the four, yeah. the four questions about what the company so we always do this uh stock investing from zero uh from zero uh what do they do how do they make money are they profitable and are they financially stable doing it uh third is who is the audience and how big can they grow and last but not least is it cheap or expensive valuation wise so i'll quickly run through uh first and foremost their business model is actually just two things. One is stockbroking. That means the trading of listed securities and also margin financing. So virtually you can borrow money to buy stock. So a lot of people think that, you know, you should invest only in property because that's the only asset class you can borrow against to buy. No, actually stocks you can also, okay? Um, they make quite a good um, healthy revenue from their margin financing. That means they actually take stock as collateral, existing stock, or they put cash and then they lend you money to actually buy more stocks, okay? Um, the second part of the business is what we call corporate finance. So corporate finance means you want to IPO your company, we will do the due diligence, we will do what we call underwriting or they'll take up the risk to uh, list the company. They also do placement. So that means once once you've uh, already uh, gotten approval from Bursa Malaysia that you can list the company, they will do, they will say, hey, I know this high net worth investor. I know this high net worth investor. And, oh. you know, they like your business model. They actually place out. So you actually get a fee for placing all this as well, uh, Louis. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, I mean, that sounds like quite a good business, right? Yes, yes. So like, let's say your mother's shop wants to list or your, your, your father's business wants to list, right? So they list. And then I'm the underwriter. Let's say I'm Mercury. Um, uh, you will have to pay me because it's my network. So I have to market to mm -hmm. my network of yeah, high high net worth investors or institutional investors, and you there's a placement fee that you actually pay. So these are all public information. Usually, it's about depending on the stock, it can range anywhere from zero point five to one percent or higher. Sometimes even two percent. 
Yeah, wow. so that means I place one million worth of your shares, they get one percent. So they're making more than the real estate brokers, essentially, right? Because the, especially the quantum, part, uh, yeah. because the quantum is big. Mm -hmm. right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh these are the two revenue segments, okay? Uh how, what do they do and how do they make money? So I'll I'll give you a breakdown. Um her, roughly about financial year 2022, roughly about 30% comes from the IPO and what we call the corporate finance. So that means they get the, the fees to help the company list and also all the placements. Cumulatively, they make about 30% of their revenue from there. The remaining 69 to 70% is from the stockbroking business, from the margin business and all that. Lah. So are they profitable? Yeah, I think uh, quite. Uh, the, the highest year to date of the four years that they were audited, was actually last year, eh, no, no, the year before, 2021, they made about 61 million in sales. Okay, um, very high gross profit margin. Because if you think about it, stock broking business, you don't have inventory, you don't have a factory to run. A lot of it is people, uh, IT systems, because stock broking and relationship. You're actually monetizing the relationship you have. If you think about it, it's like mm. IT deals, right? All these kind of things. So a lot of it hinges to relationship. There are gross margins for a business that makes about 40, 50 million a year. You're talking about gross of 40, 40, 50 percent, you know. And then PAT or profit after tax margins is roughly about 30 to 40 percent. So it's mm. you, you think about a business, right? Most even Nestle Malaysia, huge, six billion in sales, right? But you're talking about a net margins of roughly between single high single digits to like low double digits you know you're talking about maybe eight nine nine to probably 12 15 percent kind of margins because you have to hold inventory you have to manage your working capital really well in in the case of a stock broker you don't really need that kind of uh management of inventory working capital also is not that tough you know i hope i'm making sense to you working capital means you have to yeah, buy yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking like you know, like um, is is it like a sustainable you know margin to maintain in in the long term because like they're at this scale right now, right? And correct, yeah. correct. Actually, they okay. they in the bigger scheme of things, Louis, which leads to the next question: Who is their audience and how big can mm -hmm. they grow? They're actually quite small. They're actually very so small that uh they're lumping together into others. Okay, I, I tell you what I mean. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a chart. Uh, and the chart actually shows all the participating organizations that actually uh, form what we call Bursa Malaysia today. So participating oh, organizations that means brokers. Ah. These are brokers. Ah. Okay. 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 So if you look at the, if you look at this uh, chart, right, uh, the biggest participating organization, this is, this chart is actually given out monthly. Every month they will, they will show it. And for August, ending August uh, 2023, Afin Huang and Kenaga are the top two. So how how are they sized up? It's actually this thing called trading volume and trading value. So trading volume means how much of volume that you actually trade in a market, like how many shares, units, and all that kind of thing. Then trading value is how much fees have you generated from trading all these activities, okay? So you can see, right, Afin Huang, uh, just for the month of August, it's 24, this is in billion, I think. Yeah, 24 billion units. Regardless, ah, you need trust, lah, share, stuff, whatever. In a market, it's all these warrants, the benches, everything lumped together, 24 uh, billion units, okay? Percentage of the market, they move roughly about 15%. Second, very close second, Kenaga, about 19% of the market, 31 billion. But in terms of trading value, Afin is higher by about 1 billion. So that's why in terms of ranking, Afin is the highest. Now, mm. if, you, if you look at the list, right? You don't see you don't see Mercury. Yeah, right? yeah <laughs> it's right. together so, as so others. Like sixteen, right? <laughs> yeah, it's lumped together. It's sixteen together as others. So year to date, you see the big daddy in town is usually just the three lah: Afin Huang, CIMB, CGS, Kenaga, Maybank. And what you notice, uh, uh, Louis, mm. Afin Huang Investment Bank. There's a Berhad, so that means it's listed, but oh, it's a bank. Oh. But if you see the rest, CGS, CIMB, Security, Sunrem Berhad, and then Maybank Berhad. Kenaga Berhad, the rest are all uh, UBS Security Sunrem Berhad. So remember just now you you uh, when you talked about uh, listing, uh, uh, I said it's been a long time since they listed a broker. Okay, the last I remember, and you know maybe the audience will know better than this, but uh, I, the last I remember was Kenaga, if I'm not mistaken, as the last oh, listed one. Wow, that's been a while. That's yeah, it's been, been quite quite a while. Yeah, wow. yeah. So okay. even if you look at Malacca Securities, also Sunrem Berhad, 
Hong so like, what, what, what keeps their volume low? Are they like only accepting certain types of like investors or are retail investors also welcome? They they do have a mix of insti retail, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but I think it's the amount you spend on marketing. You see the beauty of a bank back broker, the bank becomes mm -hmm. a distribution channel. You see, like Afin, you oh. have a bank, ma. So a lot of people I, I know, like you you open an account is convenience. Hey, okay lah, just yeah. open another stock broking account, right? Yes, but if I always you, thought that you had to have like be a bank to do this to be a uh, stock broker. Yes. Not necessarily in, in the US it's very common to have non-bank back. But in Malaysia, if you look at it, the struggle is bank back usually wins the game because of distribution. Mm -hmm. So if you look at all these guys, right? Hong Leong is bank back, JP Morgan is bank back. I think the only one which I which I know which is not is Kananga. Yeah, that's correct. the only one I know that is it, not it's, bank. It's not bank, correct, correct. Mm. But even then, their array of services is much more than Mercury. The mm. array of services, uh, investment bank, because investment bank, you can do quite a lot of things, not just corporate finance and stock broking. You, know? you can but, do the ventures. But like can, Kananga, do... can, they, can they also do like IPOs for, for companies? Yeah, 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 they do. They do. Oh, I didn't know they, that. They, they do. Also, they, they do. are direct combat competitors. Like. Correct, correct, correct. So Kananga, in, in a way, it's, I think, the largest independent uh, in Malaysia, non bank bank. Mm. Yeah, yeah correct, correct. Yeah. It's probably the one that most people know. Yeah, that I, I know Kananga from my mom. Uh -huh. So yeah, and also rest, I think they spend a lot of money in marketing. So you yeah, and they have it. like huge like, I mean back then lah, but I think now their offices are much smaller. But like in Niri, it used to be like a whole block, like a whole block of Kananga. That's how I I knew of them lah. And okay. that was everyone went to their building, but I've never seen but uh this Mercury's building. I've never seen it anywhere. Yeah, they they have one branch in Kuching actually, you know. Uh, but I I I, I don't know where it is. Uh, and uh, it, it's it, you know to run a branch, it's actually a lot of money. It's a lot of opex cost. Now, there's one reason why Kanaga is bigger. Also, uh, Louis, I don't know if you've heard of this company called ECM Libra. No, ECM Libra used to be a stockbroker as well. They okay. got acquired by Kanaga. Oh, that's why it, it actually it was uh, it, it's quite recent. Uh, it's only about like two years ago, 2020. In April 2020, yeah. Kanaga actually acquired... Uh, but Kanaga uh, was already big even before that. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Obviously, yeah. by acquiring Libra, oh, it would yeah. be, yeah. be, be even bigger. Yeah, grow, grow bigger. Yes. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, so like, I mean, given this, we're looking at the, the question of a tree, how big it can grow up with there, right? Yeah. So, looking at this, a lot of these, like... um. Uh, competitors are bank back. What what's the potential for 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 Mercury to grow? Then, do they need to then do more marketing? What what should they do? Actually, I, I'm not three, sure. Uh, three things are uh, three things mm -hmm. now. In the past, uh, when I say in the past, I mean prior to 2023, you can you only need to compete with these guys, the Afin Wang, the Kanagas, and all this. Right. Guys. Okay. Now the problem is compounded more. Why is because uh -huh. we are allowing for foreign brokers to come in. Oh, so you know, Mumu, Putu, mm -hmm. Mumu, Putu, Tiger, yes. Tiger Brokers. Okay, oh. so when you get foreign uh, brokers to come in, what happens is this they've got the scale, they've got the spending power yep. to do MA, yep. they've got the money to actually develop apps. This is the bigger problem. Like, if you tell if you ask me this question like two years ago, when the market was more regulated and they don't, they don't, they don't allow uh, more brokers to come in, international brokers. Then, in a way, the competition is this. Uh, your addressable market is this. It's not easy for Mercury to go to Thailand or to Philippines because then you have to comply with the regulatory requirements of that country and its cost, upfront cost. Then you gotta and then you gotta you gotta steal clients from the current incumbents of that country, you know. And that's very, very uh uh what do you call it? Uh it's difficult, uh, it's difficult, uh, right? So <clears throat> in Malaysia, even with competing with these guys, it's already these guys are like bang bag bigger distribution and then now you've got the tigers coming in you've got the the mumus coming in right wow so the younger generation right they will want what better app is it mobile friendly can yeah. i trade foreign markets what kind of instruments mm -hmm. can i trade rather than just the cost you know and the mm, broken cost right. has come down quite a lot yeah a lot a lot so you're you're, you're fighting you're fighting on pittance or you're fighting on pennies all right so that's why for Mercury, they wanted to focus on the margin financing because oh. that's where you get more, uh, what do you call it, um, more bang for your buck. It's profitable, okay? Because the interest rates can range anywhere between 5% all the way to 18%. Because legally, 
bank negara allow you to charge up to 18 legally lah. But if it's so like competitive, right? Unless yeah. everyone does the same, you know, then correct, you can't correct. Really do that without a proper reason why. Um, so would you say like okay, if if let's say there's so many like new players, especially foreign players, which you know they come in, they're mobile first. I would say yes. that that's one of the draws, right? They're mobile first, a lot of young people on them. Then, um, Mercury wouldn't you know focus too much on that segment. Would you would you say that's their play? Yeah, that, if, that if they, they want to. I think it's still also a long game, Louis, because you don't just build an app and just launch and then get it get it right, right the first yeah. time. You know, you, you it's an iteration and iteration and iteration, and not only that. Your mind share, like people, like if you go to, if you go to the market, right, and a lot of people crowd around like places like i3 mm -hmm. uh, for market news and all that. You're not even prominent. Then secondly, like what you said, Kanaga is so big. They're big branches, big that one, right? Mm -hmm. You have to go up against these people, you know. So what's your yep. what's your unique selling proposition? You you gotta think about that, and then and then couple with now if you can't trade foreign stocks. Right, if you, even if you can, but you charge like double or triple the price of uh, Mumu, Futu, or uh, Tiger or interactive brokers, then again, then what's the next thing? Oh? Service, oh? margins. Oh? So that means, do you have the time, resource? Are you allocating like a single individual dealer to deal with 10 people? Then they get customized service, but then you have to charge higher. How many people will pay for that? Again, question mark. Lah. So that's, that's a niche that. It's How about not, that, that IPO part though? Like that's one of the key, also key correct. services, right? But you also have to fight against the Canadians, oh, the AMs, and all that kind. Of. Yeah. So your listing team is also very important because they had to go out and source for business. Are they competent enough that you know they have a good relationship with Bursa? Uh, they have quite a good record. They've successfully listed almost all the companies that they've taken on. Uh, to be honest and place oh, out all mean, the I mean, just, it just feels like there's a lot of competition on so many sides, you know, like yes. there's, a, there's the institutional bank side, then there's just all these like incumbent sides, right? Yeah, so exactly. Kind of fighting in all directions. Correct, correct, correct. And and they're not cheap, by the way, to the last question, Louis, they're not cheap mm. as well because they're listed at a P, roughly at a P of 21 times now, okay? And Kanaga being more established, bigger size, uh, firing on all cylinders, Last traded at about P of 13.7, 14 times. Ah. Oh, so again, wow. you see, right? Uh, someone like how many times bigger than you? And then, okay, so I, I have uh, Mercury's stats here. Their trading volume for 2022 is about 6 billion, 6.6 .6 billion. So if you look at the smallest guy here, uh, this is about 1 billion. I don't know why Mercury wasn't there if it's like. Oh, this is six billion per year. Sorry. So you, can you see uh on the list number 15 CLSA securities per heart is 6.7 billion. Mercury did only about 6.6 .6 billion. That's why they're lumped together as others. Uh. They're uh, smaller uh, than the CLSA. La. Okay. C okay. C S C L S A, correct. C L S A, correct, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, so okay. valuation mm. wise, also, you know, expensive. Higher expensive than Malacca okay. uh, um, um, so, sounds so like a very com competitive red ocean that they're fighting in. And yeah, and yeah. Hopefully, I mean, oh, hopefully for Mr. Chu, he finds a niche <laughs> like the margin and really like mm -mm. uh double down on that because that's yeah. that's what they've been doing well. But obviously, with all these other competitors coming in, I think he has to be vigilant on all on those uh, as well. Yeah. So as investors, I guess we have to wait and see what he does. Oh, uh, what Correct. he how he 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 drives this captains this ship. You know, Correct. post Correct. IP. I think I think it's one thing to be in pri private, and then another quite a different game after IPO. Right? That's right. That's right. Okay, so um, that's it for the um analysis around Mercury Securities. Let us know what you think about the analysis in the comments below. So we'll move on to our last section in today's episode, which is the book recommendation. So what what's the investing book or investing related book that you like to recommend today, John? Okay, so since it's so funny that you mentioned Kanaga, so <laughs> okay. we're going to talk about Kanaga even more. Um, oh. actually, yeah, the the book that I'm going to recommend is actually the first Malay lady stockbroker and her story. Interesting. Okay. Wow, that is a very interesting find, John. Yeah, yeah. So I read the book probably about two years ago. Uh, it's uh, The title of the book is Tengku Nur Zakia, Malaysia's Pioneering Stockbroker. So she's the co-founder of Kanaga. Uh, and Kanaga, what today we know as Kanaga Investment Bank, okay, and she's actually royal blood, Patani, Patani wow. royalty. Uh, that's why she has the name Tengku in front, ma. Um, oh. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Wow, that, what a rich history Kananga actually has. Huh? Yes, yeah, very, very rich history. Um, the, the, the interesting part about the book was also about how stocks were bought and sold during her time when she started. It was actually scripts. So if you really want to understand history of Malaysian stockbroking before we went electronic, yeah, it's detailed quite well in, in the book. Lah. So I'm good. I'm, rather than me spoil the surprise and you know, like let you guys read through the book and really get this 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 gist, right? I'm just gonna go very briefly. Lah. Um it gives you the name, why the name came about, okay, of the uh why Kanaga this this name came about, and um the history is very related to the family, the name uh, where the family actually stayed, all that kind of thing. Um she remained executive chairman for Kanaga all the way until January 2007. So she founded the company way back in the 19, uh, uh, 1960s, no, 1970s, 1973. She was in the stockbroking business since 1960s. You know, that's when, you know, my even my dad was like a teenager. <laughs> no, wow. yeah, teenager, yeah. Okay. Um, it's also about her principles and how she wanted to grow the company and the learning process because she was a mother, she was a, a boss. She was a wife to a husband. She was the first lady member of the Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange Committee. Today is known as Bursa Malaysia. Lah. And um, yeah, founding founders. That's, of that's the, amazing. One of the power women in, in our history. Correct, correct, correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I really thought, you know, I was thinking about what was the book. And then we, we feature a lot of international authors. Mm -hmm. But then correct, correct. our local heroes, are we don't have enough Yellow? people Yellow, writing about all this history, you know, right? Mm -hmm. So luckily they produced a book about, about her. Um, they conferred her a Lady Extraordinary Award in 2014, uh, recognizing her contribution. And uh, she received this thing called the Icon Penyaga Wati in 2015 as well. So I, I guess to summarize it, the book is really a phases in her life. Mm -hmm. uh, how did she overcome some of the challenges? And what was it like, you know, stop broking back then? You know, what was very male dominated? How did she start with her principles? What did she envision Kanaga to be? And, you know, uh, until yeah, today. 16, I can imagine how male dominated it is. Yeah, it that's right. That's then. right. Even how male dominated it is still today. So, right. What, what, a, what a great find that I, I, I'm excited to read it after I read 30 more books. <laughs> oh <my laughs> yeah, too many books. Yeah, but, but great find, great find. I always love your recommendation, Sean. Okay, so that's about it for today's um, episode. So we're going to wrap it up. Uh, our, our episode today on stock investing from zero on one hero. So over to you, our audience. Did you invest in Mercury Securities IPO? If so, why did you comment your answer below? For those who did not, are you thinking to do so? Leave your answers in the comment sections below too. If you found this video useful, do give us a thumbs up as it helps us with the YouTube algorithm. And if you want more stock analysis for beginners, subscribe to Wang Hero as we publish weekly videos on stock analysis on this channel. Thanks again for watching and we hope to see you again in our next video. Bye-bye.